Professor uh, Anthony Killard from the uh, University of West England uh, in Bristol, UK, and uh, is going to share with us about new uh, technological approaches to uh, blood coagulation monitoring. Uh, let me tell you something more about uh, Professor Killard. Uh, he has been Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the University of the West England for almost 10 years. Uh, his main uh, area of teaching is hematology, and his area of research is in the bioanalytical field. He got his PhD in DCU, which is Dublin City University, where uh, he focused on the development of engineered antibodies. And then he worked with uh, Professor Malcolm Smith, who is one of the pioneers in electrochemical sensors and biosensors, to develop a novel analytical techniques based on electrochemical detection. In the last 10 years, he focused on the develop development of diagnostic technologies and the use of low cost uh, mass production approaches such as uh, screen printing and inject printing, for example. He spent time both in industry and academia and is very active in the commercialization of research. I have known Tony since many years. Actually, the first time we met, I was uh, still a PhD student. And I'm very happy that he accepted our invitation today because he's the kind of uh, scientist and person that if you have any question, any doubt about anything, you ask him and he will know the answer. So uh, we are very lucky today to have the opportunity to attend his talk. So uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Killard and uh, please Tony, whenever you're ready to start. Okay, let's see if I can uh, get this to work. Okay, um, can everybody see my screen then? I think so, yeah. Brilliant, okay. Well, well first of all, um, let me say um, thanks very much to, to Alessandra uh, for and, and all the team uh, at NTU for the kind invitation to uh, come and talk to you. Um, for me, it's the morning, a slightly dark uh, autumn morning in Bristol in the UK. And for you guys there, it's a, a, just another lovely day in Singapore uh, in, the, in the afternoon. <clears throat> so uh, it's lovely to reach across the planet to you all. Um, I think I, I wanted, or I chose this particular presentation and I, can, I hope I can live up to Alessandra's uh, comments there in terms of being able to answer all your questions. Um, but I wanted to maybe do a presentation that was maybe looking at an area that you're possibly slightly less familiar with, um, that um, uh, may be a little bit of, of interest, that there's a lot of technology around various types of sensors and applications in diagnostics. Um, but one of the ones that I think maybe doesn't get much attention uh, is, is around the whole field of hemostasis uh, and, and how we can improve uh, the measurement of both bleeding and, and clotting uh, dysfunctions using, using new technologies. So, so that's why I thought that today's uh, presentation might be a little bit different to uh, other uh, things that you might come across and immediately, oh, well, here we go. So, right, okay. So just, just a little bit more about um, my own background and what I'll do is maybe if I, um, should I hide my screen so that everybody can see the screen more clearly and I'm not taking up any space on the screen. <clears throat> um, just in general terms, my main areas of interest as, as uh, Alessandra has, has, has outlined uh, is really the development of novel diagnostic platforms and really uh, within that, there are several elements to that. Um, we try and use advanced materials, taking advantage of the new advances in you know, nanotechnology and, and new materials to get better uh, performance of assays and devices. Um, we're obviously very interested in the whole area of, of um, simple low cost fabrication technologies. And you know, sometimes that can be based on sort of more sophisticated polymer MEMS, but very often we use a lot of various print techn techniques and technologies from inkjet, screen printing, and even today you'll see a little bit of uh, wax printing uh, as, as some of our paper-based devices. Um, and obviously then integrating some kind of bioassay 
uh, measurement uh, and analytical approach into these devices. And really the idea is to <clears throat> see if we can make devices that are maybe more amenable to widespread use, particularly at point of care, but, but that still provide you know, good performance, that, that, that they're as good as uh, uh, hospital-based uh, or, or laboratory-based te technologies, and that they can also be sort of readily transferred uh, to manufacturing processes. So just a little bit of background in terms of hemostasis. I'm not sure of my audience and what they do know and what they don't know. So apologies if, first of all, it's too simplistic and apologies also if, if I don't go into enough detail uh, in, in the background area. <coughs> but hemostasis, as you probably all know, is, is the regulation of, of, uh, of blood loss. And it, it's a normal physiological process in which um, damage or injury to the vasculature is, is halted and, and stopped. Uh, to ensure that um, that there's no further blood loss, but but that normal process of controlling uh, bleeding uh, and clotting um, can go wrong, uh, and it can go wrong in two directions. It can lead to uh, excessive clotting, so the body is too predisposed to uh, form clots when it when it shouldn't, uh, or it can lead to excessive bleeding events. As I say, that that, that uh, clotting is is ineffective. And, and does not uh, clot uh, efficiently and sufficiently. And in terms of clotting, that really can, that excessive clotting, that can come in two major forms. One in the arterial circulation, um, and it's very much associated with atherosclerosis um, and, and really relates to the function and behavior of platelets around uh, plaques uh, that form in the arterial system. But also uh, on the venous side, uh, it relates to uh, venous thrombotic disorders where uh, clots uh, predominantly. So we talk about white clots and red clots. So in atherosclerosis with platelets, we talk about white clots, which are dominated by the presence of platelets. Whereas in venous thrombotic disorders, uh, this is predominantly driven by the coagulation process. And, and this can relate to things like uh, stasis due to lack of effective blood flow. And also uh, a, a predisposition to clotting, possibly a genetic predisposition to clotting in terms of uh, thrombophilia. <clears throat> and then with excessive bleeding, well, this can relate to a number of different uh, clotting disorders that affect various parts of the, the whole uh, hemostatic system. Um, and this can relate to um, coagulation factor deficiencies, which you commonly know as hemophilias, like hemophilia A, B, C. Um, dysfunctions in, in platelets themselves, so the platelets aren't playing an effective role. Uh, a disease called von Willebrand's disease, which, which affects how platelets interact with the vasculature, and, and a number of others, a number of other acquired dysfunctions that you can have. <clears throat> so really the diagnosis and control of, of both clotting and bleeding is, is a critical uh, process in, in, in modern medicine. And, uh, you know, there are still a lot of gaps in how effectively this can be done. Uh, and so it does leave room for new technologies to, to allow us to do that. And just, just to really illustrate at a very basic level, the, the complexity of the uh, hemostatic process um, is that it involves lots of positive and negative regulatory processes. It involves soluble uh, enzymatic species, it involves um, cellular components such as platelets and, and, and uh, red and, and white blood cells. Um, and, and all these act in concert to, to bring about effective or indeed ineffective uh, clotting or um, bleeding processes. Uh, and so we have to bear this in mind when we're investigating uh, coagulation disorders and, and, and how to uh, diagnose them and measure them because we may not always be looking at all of these processes all of the time. And, and that is often a challenge with a lot of the standard coagulation tests that are used uh, in hospitals and in the laboratory. So there's a problem with both the accessibility of technology, but also the uh, appropriateness and effectiveness of the various tests. So, I mean, the first point to make is that still a lot of testing is really uh, dependent on central hospital laboratory testing, like the big instrument down in the bottom left-hand corner. These are 
you know, big random access analyzers that can have high throughputs of samples, but really not very accessible to anybody outside the hospital environment, and don't always give rapid uh, you know, point of point of care, point of measurement uh, information. Now there have been and there has been progress to, you know, those sim simpler portable handheld devices that we're all familiar with these days, uh, particularly around blood glucose measurement and this also applies to a small number of blood coagulation screening tests. So you can get these, particularly for monitoring um, anticoagulant therapy. If you're on an anticoagulant therapies, the, these um, uh, types of devices are available. Um, but again, they only tell you a little bit about what's happening in terms of coagulation. And they're not extremely widely accessible, certainly for instance, to low resource economies, um, there, there would be hard for these to be, to be made available. <clears throat> and that um, complexity um, and lack of availability has been a sort of a motivation for some of the technologies that, that we have been trying to develop. And, you know, just a simple recap, because I'm, I'm sure you're all well aware of the whole lateral flow assay concept that's been around for uh, a very long time and works extremely effectively to allow a, a, a very ordinary individual um, like myself or yourselves at home uh, or wherever to perform um, quite complex diagnostic tests. And I think maybe the most familiar one uh, to everybody is something like a, a pregnancy test strip, uh, which uses um, antibodies to detect uh, the increase in HCG, which results during pregnancy and is, is quite conveniently present in urine in, in fairly large quantity. And so things like a pregnancy test strip where uh, the user urinates on uh, a, a strip and that the HCG combines with antibodies uh, in the, uh, on the strip to give either you know, positive or negative uh, test lines on the, on the strip. And you know the advantages here is that it is relatively low cost. It can be mass produced, um, and uses some quite simple technology uh, in the in the form of nitrocellulose paper. So it uses the the, the movement of the sample, or the capillary flow of the sample, to drive the, um, the drive the assay dynamics, drive the assay interactions. Um, and now that requires. And may only require direct visual analysis, although there have been some new strips that use uh, that I think um, there's one company that produces a device that uh, it reads the strip for you, um, but is obviously then more technically complex. So there's a balance between, uh, you know, can I do the visual analysis myself versus the effectiveness of that visual analysis or whether it needs additional instrumentation. So there's, there's various ways of looking at, at that particular problem. I think one of the challenges uh, that's been experienced with, for instance, paper-based devices uh, has been obviously the, the reproducibility of what is basically a natural cellulosic product. So something like nitrocellulose, the cellulose at a, at a, at a small length scale is actually a non-uniform material, and this can potentially impact the uh, uniformity and variability of flow on the material. And obviously you've got to um, take into account the uh, chemical um, characteristics of the cellulose and, and how materials interact with it and, and, and adapt your assays appropriately. And this is probably going back quite a number of years now. Um, we, we started working with a, a then small Swedish company called Omic who were then uh, bought out by ortho clinical diagnostics who were at that time developing um, a mass producible hot embossed uh, micro pillar chip plastic chip made of a low water fluorescent cyclic polyolefin polymer uh, and uh, you know developing it as the basis of uh, some diagnostic assay platforms based on lateral flow approaches and you know the obvious benefits here are that you know the the micro pillars are uh, very controlled structures that give very controlled flow dynamics uh, in terms of the capillary action uh, of a liquid moving through them. So this had the potential at least to lead to maybe more assay control. And also you can 
create more complex architectures with this type of um, uh, fabrication process, whereas nitrocellulose paper, you're really confined to a, a, a simple strip format. Um, although that wasn't really necessary for anything that, that, that we did in, in terms of our research. So we, we could see and were, were interested in developing novel coagulation assays at the time. And we saw the obvious um, potential for the crossover between these types of devices and possibly measuring uh, uh, blood coagulation. And, and for that, I, I, I apologize that I do need to give you a little bit of a lesson uh, in uh, blood coagulation, uh, just in case you're, you're, you're not entirely familiar with the process, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and and for, first of all, this by no means characterizes all the different types of uh, coagulation tests that are available. But what it does highlight is it highlights some of the principal uh, screening assays that are used to uh, see if there's a, a dysfunction in the, in the coagulation process. So in the diagram on the right, you can see a number of um, pathways um, which start off uh, in two distinct uh, streams. You've got something called the extrinsic pathway and something called the intrinsic pathway. And like a lot of biological research, um, they have their origins in the gradual discovery of how the coagulation cascade uh, operates. Um, but just to say that the, the in vivo pathway for the coagulation of um, blood in, 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 in animals and humans is actually what's called the extrinsic pathway. And what happens is that um, the tissue is damaged uh, uh, around the vasculature, and this releases and activates a material called, called tissue factor. And this goes through a number of uh, uh, steps which result in a cascade reaction. So really what's happening here is this is a cascade reaction in which um, there are ever, ever increasing uh, levels of many of these coagulation factors. <clears throat> now, um, in the laboratory, you can also activate coagulation through a separate pathway, which is called the intrinsic pathway. But really that is, so these two pathways are critical from a diagnostic point of view. But from a biological point of view, this is the dominant process. The, the key thing to note is that when you follow the coagulation pathway, the key event is the conversion of an insoluble protein called fibrinogen to, uh, to sorry, I always get that wrong, a soluble protein called fibrinogen into an insoluble uh, uh, product called fibrin. And that fibrin effectively becomes um, uh, chemically cross-linked, forming uh, a very solid uh, fibrin clot. And so this is, the, this is the thing that results in the clotting of your blood, but has to go through these pathways. And depending on um, the characteristics of the assays that we perform, uh, that is the reagents that we use to activate these pathways, we can evaluate if there is dysfunction in one or either of these pathways. So for instance, um, if we add externally to the blood sample that we take, we add tissue factor, which obviously uh, mimics the damaged vasculature, and phospholipids, which mimics the presence of platelets uh, in the sample, uh, then we can activate coagulation via this pathway and look for any defects that may be present. Whereas we can, by using some other reagents, including some phospholipids, we can activate via this pathway and see if there are problems in this, uh, specific problems in this pathway. <clears throat> However, when we're looking at how long, it, how long it takes a blood sample to clot in terms of clotting time assays, they're all dependent on the formation of a fibrin clot as the outcome of the clotting time. So basically what we do is we're measuring how long it takes blood to start to form a clot. And for that to happen, there must be sufficient fibrinogen in the sample to allow that to happen. And that's not always the case. So we need a separate assay that allows us to look at how much fibrinogen is in the sample. And in this instance, what we do is we add the enzyme thrombin directly to the blood sample and we convert the available fibrinogen to fibrin and we can measure how effective that process is. So we have a number of different tests 
that look at either of these two pathways and the level of fibrinogen in the sample. And there's another one that I'll show you a little bit about uh, uh, later as well, is that one of the key coagulation factors in this process uh, is something called factor 10A. And factor 10A, if you like, is at the crossroads of, of these two pathways and is often used uh, independently of these other measures because uh, a number of particular drugs, anticoagulant drugs, uh, can target specifically this factor 10A uh, enzyme. And so therefore we use a specific anti-factor 10A assay that allows us to see how much effect that anticoagulant is having on that enzyme. So one of the first assays that we, we, we produced was for measuring the fibrinogen concentration uh, in both plasma and blood samples using uh, these types of strip. And, and really, from a, from a technical perspective, it's, it's relatively unsophisticated in the sense that we, we took the, the chips uh, and we were able to modify these with um, a uh, concentration of thrombin and a little bit of, of surfactant in the form of Triton to ensure that, that there was effective, um, there was effect, effective uh, uh, liquid flow uh, down the strip. And basically what happens is that when the blood sample uh, hits the device, and as it starts to move through and dissolve the uh, thrombin on the strip, that thrombin immediately converts any fibrinogen in the blood sample into fibrin, and then it starts to clot. And so the assumption is that as it's clotting, uh, the faster it's clotting, or the more effectively it's clotting, the slower and less distance the um, material will move down the strip. And in fact, this is uh, exactly what happens. Uh, this is a graph of the distance traveled down the strip. Uh, in the blue line, we see uh, the uh, plasma. Um, we can see the effect of plasma. We can see quite a steep slope uh, and, and in terms of the fibrinogen concentration in the sample. So there's a quite a, an excellent linear relationship between the uh, distance traveled on the strip and, and the fibrinogen concentration. And this little box here represents what would be the typical sort of normal range in, in humans, normally around somewhere around three grams per liter in blood, maybe varying up or down. So someone down here would have abnormally low fibrinogen levels, which might put them at risk of, of premature bleeding. And up here might put them at risk of excessive clotting uh, in some way. And you can see here with, with whole blood that the obviously the red blood cells bring about some viscosity impact on the sample. Uh, and so you can see that it has a very different slope. But nonetheless, there's a, there's a clear relationship between the two. And when compared to, uh, you know, look, looking at patient samples, the calibrators and patient samples, uh, you can see that, that there's excellent correlation with, with laboratory-based uh, approaches. So that was a relatively simple assay. Um, it was, you know, it could be read visually, um, it could be used um, without any, any, potentially without any technology. Um, and we have looked at some other approaches that maybe require a little bit more sophisticated uh, uh, instrumentation around them, which, as I said already, isn't normally very ideal. Um, but, but is often uh, interesting in terms of exploration of, of how assay systems might work. And, and one, of the, one of the issues around clotting time measurements, so measuring how long it takes for blood to clot, is that it's often based on very arbitrary, either visual or machine-based values. So the classic way of performing a clotting time test is really very simple is that you um, mix the reagents with the plasma sample in a, in a test tube and you, you keep rocking it backwards and forwards until you see either a clot form or, or you see the formation of some fibrin fibers in the, in the sample. And you just take that as your clotting time. Um, whereas in, in, for instance, some instruments, um, they will look at the change in optical density over some period of time and assign an arbitrary value. So, um, there's nothing scientific, shall we say, um, about uh, why we pick these values. They are effectively arbitrary baselines based on uh, a methodology. Um, but fibrin formation is a bit more interesting and complicated than that. Um, fibrin clot formation is, is, is regarded as a stochastic process, uh, which, which, which is a, a clever mathematician's way of saying it's quite random. And um, 
effectively it's initiated at lots of discrete loci or in at a at particular times but gradually builds up uh, and forms a a continuous clot over some period of time but during the formation of those um discrete uh, zones um what's happening is that uh, the fibrinogen is being converted to fibrin in a localized area and this then obviously requires the movement of fibrinogen from the surrounding bulk into those localized areas to drive the formation of the fibrin clot. And then that grows outwards from those uh, loci or loci to uh, form the full clot and various loci will join together and form a continuous clot. So we wanted to potentially exploit that. We had these micro pillars uh, as part of our device and, and um, if we drive the coagulation process, uh, that these pillars may form the sites of loci uh, on which um, uh, coagulation uh, will be focused and then spread throughout the uh, throughout the sample. So what we used is we used a, a, a fluorescent fibrinogen marker. So it's a fluorescently labeled fibrinogen molecule, but which becomes incorporated into the forming clot. And as you can see at time zero here, this marker is distributed uh, evenly and equally throughout the, um, throughout the uh, sample giving low fluorescence. But what we found was that um, uh, if we drove the clotting process through activation of coagulation, we could see that um, we get these high intensity uh, zones of fluorescence formation around the uh, micropillar structures and we get these dark zones uh, adjacent to that uh, in which uh, there's minimum uh, minimal levels of the uh, fluorescently labeled um, marker present and, and what we found is that if we analyze these images using a, a, a uh, camera uh, with, with and, and analyze the pixelation levels in this we found that if we looked at the the, 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 the deviation of the fluorescence levels uh, in the sample over time, that, that there was a very rapid inflection point uh, at some point uh, during the coagulation process, but there's a very defined inflection point that, that we felt was the basis of some biological phenomenon in which um, the coagulation process had gone through some lag period and then had rapidly gone into some rapid rapidly exponential phase of, of coagulation. So we felt that this was an important and biologically meaningful point in the coagulation process to, um, to, to use as a measurement, if you like. So um, one drug that's very useful for developing uh, one type of assay, this activated partial thromboplastin time assay, is actually the drug heparin. Um, because you can add heparin directly to the plasma sample and you can have an immediate impact on the um, clotting of the sample and it's a concentration dependent effect. So, so what we did was we, we would mix um, blood plasma samples with various concentrations of, of heparin. This is a therapeutically relevant range of heparin, say zero to two units per mil. Um, and then we would activate the coagulation process via uh, this um, intrinsic pathway using the reagent I, I illustrated earlier called the partial thromboplastin. Um, and then you can see from this that if we monitor the uh, distribution through the standard deviation of the fluorescent signal in the, in the, in the sample, um, in the image, you can see that for each of these, no matter how long it was taking to clot, there was a very clear inflection point. Now, one of, the, one of the challenges with coagulation clotting time assays is that because of this stochastic function, the longer the assay takes, the more variable becomes the onset of the clotting process. And so actually, uh, in principle, it gets harder and harder to measure the precise onset of coagulation the longer that process takes. Whereas what we noted uh, in, in this particular assay is that it didn't matter how long coagulation was taking, there was still a very clear inflection point at which uh, there was a switch from this lag period to this exponential uh, growth period. And when we compare this to 
standard laboratory techniques, which are called coagulometers and coagulometry, we can see that our method was, you know, almost perfect uh, and as good as uh, anything that you can do in the standard laboratory uh, at the moment. And in terms of its linearity with heparin concentration, um, again, near perfect. And when analyzed with, with real patient samples, so this is the routine method of performing the APTT assay uh, in, the, in the hospital in 32 patient samples compared to our field method, um, get, getting a, a correlation coefficient of around 0.8, which you know, is, is pretty impressive for a very simple assay methodology. So that illustrates you know, um, a couple of the more basic screening assays that, that are typically used in blood coagulation analysis, so the APTT assay. That could also apply to the prothrombin time or PT assay. Um, and also uh, measuring the levels of, of uh, fibrinogen in the sample. Um, now, there's been a lot of progress, thankfully, in recent years in, in the anticoagulant drugs. Um, in the past, there may have only been a couple of, of drugs. Um, warfarin, some people may be familiar with, was for a long time the only oral anticoagulant available. Uh, for, for patients. So the only way that they could go home and continue to take an anticoagulant drug was to take warfarin. And warfarin was a very complicated drug, um, very uh, unstable, a lot of interactions with other, you know, foodstuffs and other drugs, and, 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 and it required a lot of monitoring. <clears throat> but since then, there's been a lot of new drugs. And, and one of the ways that they've been developed is they are able to target components of the coagulation cascade more and more precisely. Um, and one of um, some of these drugs, though, uh, as a consequence, do not respond well to measurement using the uh, classical assays, the prothrombin time assay or the activated partial thromboplastin time assay. So new assays have been developed uh, to, to cope with this. Um, and one of these is, is called the anti-factor 10A assay. And, and, and the reason that we're talking about factor 10A here is that um, there's, um, there's a natural circulating anticoagulant in your body, which is called antithrombin. So it's a natural protein, um, but its, it's name antithrombin is very misleading, actually, because um, while it is antithrombin, uh, that is that when it binds to thrombin, it basically disables thrombin. And then thrombin goes on to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. So if we disable thrombin, we then disable the production of the clot. However, antithrombin also affects other coagulation factors. Most notably, it affects factor 10A. So <clears throat> while antithrombin has an effect on thrombin, it also has an effect on anti 10A. Now, there are a number of drugs available. Uh, that have different effects on whether they inhibit thrombin or whether they inhibit factor 10A. So the classic drug that's used is something called unfractionated heparin. So we, we, we tend to call it heparin on its own, but we're talking about an unfractionated heparin, which is a very long polysaccharide molecule. Um, and what it does is it binds to the antithrombin and changes the binding site of the antithrombin and makes it much more um, uh, accessible to both thrombin and factor 10a. So basically then it switches off the thrombin and factor 10a. But it's been discovered that if you basically chop off the ends of this unfractionated heparin, you, you, get, you get a molecule which is called a low molecular weight heparin. And basically without this long chain, this does not form a stable interaction with thrombin. However, it forms, still forms a stable interaction with factor 10A. So these types of drugs, these low molecular weight heparins, are able to target clotting directly via factor 10A rather than through thrombin. And, and this gives better control of their uh, properties, of, of their anticoagulant properties. But it leads to a problem with their measurement. So for that, then, we use um, what's called this anti-factor 10A assay. So what effectively happens is that a patient's been administered with, for instance, a low molecular weight heparin, and this has 
uh, uh, bound to their antithrombin um, and has a capacity to, um, to inactivate factor 10A. However, we haven't clotted the blood yet, right? We're still, we're still looking at blood sample in which no factor 10A has been produced yet. So what we do in this assay is we add in factor 10A, right? We add exogenous factor 10A. And what we do then is we basically use up some portion of the factor 10A as it binds to the antithrombin low molecular weight heparin complex. And so the more complex that's formed, the more factor 10A that will become bound to, uh, to that complex. And then basically what we do is we measure the leftover uh, factor 10A once this material has been bound to the uh, heparin antithrombin complex. And to do that, we can do it in a number of ways. We can use both chromogenic and fluorogenic substrates. We can either use just color, colorimetric or fluorimetric uh, substrates to do this. Um, and one of the ways that we, we, we've looked at is basically looking at the release of um, a coumarin-based derivative, uh, acenomethylcoumarin, as a um, as a fluorescent uh, uh, substrate for the uh, free factor 10A. And these can be done in a standard laboratory in a standard 96 world plate, but nobody had yet developed these assays that could be used for point of care use. So again, we, we developed a polymer chip based approach, um, slightly different from before that it wasn't using micro pillars, but it was using a hydrophilic uh, but a low fluorescence uh, zeanore based polymer um, uh, as, as, the as, as the basis of the assay. And, and what we did was we used um, inkjet printing methods to deposit the key assay reagents uh, on the chip uh, so that they could act and react in a time sequence with, with the blood sample as it's added to the chip. So again, relatively simple and straightforward. It's not a sophisticated device. But what would basically happen is the assay dynamics would mean that the blood sample travels down here, it solubilizes and uh, interacts with the exogenous factor 10A, which binds to the um, uh, antithrombin uh, drug complex, and then travel further down the strip where they meet with the fluorogenic substrate, and then travel to the detection zone then, and the amount of, of, of fluorophore release can then be, be measured. Again, we're dealing with a system that still requires a fluorescence detection system, which re really is a problem, a challenge, for instance, if you're trying to move this to particularly low cost point of care applications. Though. So in terms of optimizing the assay, um, this graph basically shows you that um, uh, the, the buildup of the fluorescence, uh, or the fluorescence uh, product in the sample, you know, reaching the peak certainly within about six so a fairly rapid assay. Um, and you can see that reaching a, a threshold, uh, depending on the concentration used, and I think that the, the, the threshold concentration that was selected to ensure uh, effective, um, uh, an, an effective optimum of the um, fluorophore was about 150 micromolar in, in this assay. <clears throat> but then we had to ensure that um, there was sufficient um, uh, exogenous factor 10A added that it was able to titrate out um, the, the, the required amount of, of factor 10A. So remember, we're adding in a certain amount of factor 10A, um, but we don't know how much drug it's going to encounter. So we have to have enough 10A in uh, and some extra to ensure that, that we can fully titrate out the factor 10A, but leave some behind so that we can actually get some kind of measurement. So here you can see that across the, 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 the zero to one unit per mil uh, level of unfractionated heparin, that, uh, that you know, above about 60 nanomolar of the factor 10A, that we were, we were getting um, good linearity across that, um, that measurement range. And so this is really then showing you how the assay works when it's used with both unfractionated heparin, but also with the low molecular weight heparin drugs, the uh, enoxaparin and tinzaparin, which are, you know, these are commercially available, clinically used uh, low molecular weight heparin drugs. And you can see that, although there are some slight differences in the slopes of these, 
that there's consistent and linear responses for, for, for these uh, across uh, a therapeutically you know, meaningful range of, of say, 0 to 0 0.8 units per mil of, of those drugs. Um, we, we then did some comparisons with the standard laboratory chromogenic assay. So we've got the um, uh, chromogenic assay results on the uh, y-axis and we've got the device uh, measurements on the x-axis. And you can see um, that interestingly that, that the relationship with regard to unfractionated heparin is, 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 is very linear. Um, however, we, we, we've got these very non-linear profiles when we looked at the two assays in comparison to the low molecular weight heparin. And what you can basically see here is that um, at these higher concentrations in the chromogenic assay, there's, there's a loss of sensitivity uh, as the concentration of the, um, of, of the low molecular weight heparin increases. There's very little separation at these 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and 0.8 levels in the, in the chromogenic assay. So what we had here is um, an assay with very good sensitivity uh, across, the, across the dynamic range of the, of the, of the cell. And we were able to look at um, a small number of clinical samples, only about 10, um, but we were really only able to do a comparison with APTT. Now, again, and, and these have all been treated with unfractionated heparin. So um, not the study that we, we necessarily would have liked, where we would have loved to have looked specifically at patient samples with treated on a low molecular weight heparin and measured with a, a hospital laboratory-based um, uh, chromogenic or indeed fluorogenic assay. <laughs> um, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, the correlations with uh, clotting time uh, were pretty reasonable. Um, so that, that was our foray into the you know, area of you know, polymer microchip based uh, devices. And, and you know, uh, the, the, the vast amount of, of technologies out there for you know, clotting time, oh, sorry, for point of care diagnostic devices really are dependent on these types of polymer microfabrication approaches. And you know, they're extremely widely used and very effective. But, but there has been a major shift in recent years in terms of the suitability and applicability of a lot of technology, particularly with regards to the low resource environment. So poor countries and, and um, issues of biodegradability and sustainability of these materials. Um, so we, we started working with, with another Italian colleague a, a number of years ago, uh, uh, who'd been a postdoctoral researcher, in, or, sorry, a postgraduate researcher in my lab, and now he's at one of the universities in Italy, um, a chap called Stefano uh, Sinti, who'd worked with Professor Paleschi uh, in, in Rome as a part of his PhD. And he, he had been, and they had been working on immunodiagnostics that were now using, you know, back using paper-based devices. And I, I can be a little bit skeptical at times. I'm, I'm sometimes a little bit hard to convince that, well, what was new about, what was there anything new in these paper-based technologies that were being used? Um, and George Whitesides had really sort of reinvented this, should I say, or, or, or created a resurgence of interest in paper-based devices. But after a little bit of time, I felt a bit more convinced that you know, there were benefits and, and advantages to um, this uh, re-emergence of paper-based devices. So we're not necessarily talking now about using nitrocellulose-based devices, but we're using much more classical paper, uh, cellulosic paper to, uh, to develop devices. Um, and the benefits here are obviously that um, they can be, you know, maybe used in low resource environments, the cost could be very low. And if they could be made without instrumentation, that they could be read visually, that, that such devices really could have some um, uh, benefit in the in, in low resource environments. And also in distributed healthcare systems. So, you know, when, when people are away from hospitals or emergency expertise, that, that such devices could have applicability in some of those as well. So I, I thought, well, maybe this is something that we should start to look at. Um, there hadn't really been much done around blood coagulation testing. There's a, there's a guy in the US called Andrew Steckel who has done a little bit in this area. 
And um, you know, we saw that there, there could be potential in, in, in these assays and in, in this approach. So, um, and I'm very conscious of time, uh, Alessandra, and, and that I've already gone 50 minutes, which is sort of much longer than I was expecting. So if, if you wish me to discontinue at some point, I'm, I, I, can, I can draw it to an end much more quickly. Um, and we can talk about what I've talked about, or I'm quite happy to carry on if, if, if you wish. It's okay. I mean, um, maybe five, ten more minutes, you, you, you can go. Well, okay. Well, I'll take it to the hour if then, and I'll take it okay. to ten minutes, and then okay, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll definitely bring it to a halt there. Okay. Um, so, um, so I think our first attempt was also to try fibrinogen-based assays uh, that, that have been very effective in the past. Um, Fibrinogen levels are a major risk factor in low resource economies, particularly around postpartum hemorrhage. So if you've got low fibrinogen levels, your chances of dying at childbirth due to bleeding are, are increased significantly. So there is a need for this type of technology. So th the benefits of it is that it's a very easy technology to work with. You can make the strip designs in PowerPoint. You can change them around very quickly so you can alter design parameters very, very easily. Um, we're using Whatman number one paper, which seems to be the standard, although there are others that you, you can use. And then uh, in conjunction with a wax printer, uh, you can make hydrophobic um, uh, structures uh, that define the dynamic, the, the structure of the strip. And then within those strips, you can deposit reagents and you can perform uh, lateral flow assays. So again, a very simple and straightforward um, methodological approach. Uh, and, and I have a, a PhD student from, from the Gambia working on these assays at the moment, and he's done some already spectacular work uh, on developing some paper-based uh, assays, and th this one for, for fibrinogen. Um, so you can see at the graph at the top, and apologies for the slight quality issue there, but again, you can see that there's a, an, an excellent correlation in the uh, distance traveled down our strips with the um, fibrinogen concentration from about you know, one to, to seven grams per litre. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to do any clinical samples because of um, COVID and accessing the uh, NHS as a, as a source of patient samples. But what we did was we, we created some artificial uh, samples, if you like, and we, we tested these against a, an instrumental method that we, we have in our laboratory now called the UMISEN, uh, so we can we, we can uh, compare it to instrumental uh, approaches and as you can see the quality is very good um, and we are now exploring uh, other assays we've got preliminary data on both prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time assays these may require additional work and maybe be required to be made more sophisticated because you can see on the right hand side that between normal and factor deficient plasmas uh, there, there's only a small variation and we have to learn how to increase the uh, differences in the uh, on the paper strips. So that's a work in progress. I'm very quickly going to go through this last part and it, uh, apologies because it could be quite um, brought quite short and, and maybe I don't go into a lot of detail. Um, but, but one of the one of the uh, major technologies in blood coagulation monitoring is assisted, an approach called thromboelastography, um, in which um, the uh, entire properties of the blood uh, in terms of their clotting behavior uh, can be investigated uh, within a single system. So basically you can see that, you know, during this uh, clotting time test, uh, you have um, a period where there's no coagulation taking place. And then, depending on the uh, rate of clotting uh, of the sample in the instrument, we get a displacement of a uh, clotting pin, if you like. And as the sample clots, uh, we get this increase in uh, amplitude. And then, as the clot is dissolved away during the fibrinolytic process, uh, it, it, it becomes reduced. Uh, and, and this can lead to a number of different sort of clotting profiles, depending on the different uh, types of coagulation condition but again it's quite an inaccessible technology it's quite but yeah actually it's not that sophisticated from a measurement perspective 
And we, we were very interested in using quartz crystal microbalance as a, as a means of looking at coagulation process. And really, up until our work, a lot of the work that had been done with micro resonators, with QCM and coagulation was really very unsophisticated. Um, and uh, I, I brought on board a couple of researchers uh, who, who, who did a spectacular um, uh, piece of work around uh, completely reviewing uh, and developing a, an absolutely new approach to how we look at um, the changes in both the frequency and um, uh, peak width of uh, the uh, QCM um, plot over time as a blood sample is coming into contact with it. Um, and so to cut a long story short, we remodeled this and we called it the seaweed model in which we could look at the time-based evolution of the fibrinogen clot formation on the surface of the QCM crystal. Uh, and we could uh, have two parameters, a, a rigid mass and an elastic mass parameter, which we could monitor its evolution over time. So by, depending on whether we were looking at plasma or whole blood, we could look at the time-based evolution of the sample uh, and measure these parameters, these elastic and rigid mass parameters, and also a new parameter that we call the rigidity factor. So how rigid was the, were these structures? So we developed a whole system to do this. Uh, we, 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 we developed a software interface and uh, a little flow controller. And all together, then we can uh, define lots of different coagulation parameters uh, using, using this platform. Just to very quickly show you some of the characteristics, for instance, we talked about fibrinogen. So in these um, clotting time uh, responses to the QCM, you can see that the fibrinogen concentration very much um, concentration dependent. But, but using our rigidity factor ratio method, we, we get a lot of consistency. So what we have here is we have a quantitative and a qualitative parameter of coagulation. And we could also see the various effects of different blood components on the profiles. So whether we have um, uh, red blood cells present and or platelets present, we can look at the different time evolutions of clotting or no clotting with these various materials. We could also see whether um, red blood cells become, uh, uh, reduce their deformability. And this is really critical in diseases like uh, diabetes in which the red blood cells become cross-linked. And this is an area that we're particularly interested in. So we benchmarked this against standard technologies. So here again, you can see it compared to coagulometry in which there's, there's excellent there's perfect linearity coagulometry and that the instrument you saw earlier on the thromboelastograph um, you can see that there's a lack of sensitivity of the thromboelastograph particularly when fibrinogen concentrations are low whereas we were able to monitor processes effectively even at low fibrinogen concentration we were also i'll skip that slide but we were also able to see that um, we could monitor the um, effect of the coagulation process on the structure of the formed clot. So depending on how rapidly a clot forms, its structure changes quite markedly. And this has a big impact about as to how effectively the clot is, is removed. And this can have a big impact on uh, air, things like thrombophilia, the, th things like the, the, the ability to remove clots effectively. Um, and this is something only our system was able to do. We were able to show that in um, uh, thrombotic disorders, in which, and I, I would have had, liked to have had more time to explain this to you, but there's a number of thrombotic disorders which result in a um, reduced ability to limit clot formation and also remove the clot. And we were very clearly able to show that we could identify these differences between the normal behavior of, of a clot and some of these abnormal conditions. And these are not related to kinetics, these are related to the, the structure and the form of the clot itself. And um, as I said earlier on, I, if I had time, I would have gone into a little bit more detail here, but we're very interested in, in, in applying this to, for instance, uh, looking at how much red blood cells become deformed. And this, this 
could have potential applications in diabetes and sickle cell disease and possibly even malaria. So just skipping by that then. So, so just to quickly round off then, in terms of future work, um, we're quite interested in pursuing these paper-based assays. Um, we'd, we'd like to develop a fully paper-based multi-assay panel that has all the clotting assays and even some platelet assays as well, and see could we, we apply these in low resource environments. And we also want to continue the work with the QCM platform, uh, particularly looking at, for instance, the red cell deformability, but also developing a more sophisticated viscoelastic model of, of the vasculature. So we could study the vasculature in some detail from a viscoelastic perspective. So just quickly in summary, as I said, hemostatic disorders involve both bleeding and clotting. There's about 12% of hospital deaths as a result of, 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 of thrombosis. And you know, bleeding is a, a major problem, particularly in the developing world. And so new tests have to improve both the identification of those at risk of in individuals, but also extend the availability of those systems beyond established healthcare systems. So we think that simple lateral flow devices have, have a lot of potential. Um, I think that, that there's a lot we can do there and that we can use this viscoelasticity uh, to better understand um, how uh, and what's taking place during uh, clotting and bleeding events. I, I think the QCM platform has a lot of potential there. Um, so apologies for the slight rush. I always think I'm going quicker than I am and then look at the time. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. And, and if we've got some time left, I'm quite happy to uh, stay and answer some questions. Thank you.